Thank you, Chris. Thank you all for uh, having me here. This was uh, you know, two memorable days in my life. I really want to thank you profoundly on a personal uh, level, not just uh, professional. Um, wonderful and great acts to follow. So when Chris asked me to prepare this uh, intervention, he was very clear, 12 minutes. So what I do typically when I have that uh, challenge, I put my key messages on the first slide, and then the rest is icing on the cake. <laughs> um, the first message is that there are good news, and this follows up on some of the things that Charles has just mentioned. So there are good news, the business case, whatever uh, we want to call it, is actually very, very strong for this transition, right? By the way, uh, I'm framing the whole thing as, as Chris has asked us to do in terms of the, the big question, like right? how do we diffuse a new paradigm uh, within and uh, throughout the business world. And, and obviously there has to be uh, a case. And it's even if we narrow it on the uh, good old economic uh, rationality, there is a very strong business case. That's the good news. The challenges are also, however, uh, very strong. The challenges are the fact that, first of all, the business world is not necessarily aware of the good news. Um, it's not a strong challenge, but it's certainly something that we need to <laughs> underestimate. Uh, so there is a communication, a very strong communication uh, uh, challenge for that, in that sense. Uh, the, uh, the other is that actually, understand the full benefits of this new paradigm actually requires uh, a different level of consciousness to at least the beginning of an evolution of consciousness, but fundamentally an experiential level. So sustainability flourishing uh, is an experience. And unless and until companies actually go through the reality of that experience, it's very hard for them to understand the other side, the non-economic, non-financial aspects of why this makes sense to do. That's a big challenge for us, right? Because you know, you need to convince them <laughs> to do something, to experience something, only on the basis of what they really uh, currently uh, prioritize. And then there is the other uh, major challenge, is the fact that the process through which the interventions, the changes that are required are uh, unknown for the large part even to us who are uh, observing and, and living them in our own uh, professional, even more obviously to the companies that are perceived as extremely risky in terms of fundamental change, obviously, from, from their perspective. So the evolution to the new paradigm uh, needs to be understood in this, in this context. Now, and here is the third part that I would like to kind of leave to you, and hopefully we'll be able to, to discuss it, because this is the, 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 the time of, the, of our meeting where we need to make also some concrete uh, suggestions. In my view, in order to tackle those challenges, he, even here in this room, there is the potential for uh, networks and represented here as well as in other, in other places to collaborate, to so form a partnership, an ABC partnership is what I call it, uh, with academics, with consultants, and, and obviously with businesses. Uh, as the fundamental actor, uh, that would uh, first of all start the experimentation, so the lab, the, con the notion of a global, if you want, virtual lab where companies uh, can feel comfortable to make the, exper the, the experiments, the internal transformational change experiments that are necessary. Uh, and then, of course, uh, exchange their experiences and, and also consider system level the collaborative change. The second part of it is actually something that I've already started doing. Um, you know, in collaboration with the World Bank, uh, we are creating uh, something that we're calling sustainable or, or, or flourishing world academy 
where we are actually developing executive education as well as MOOCs uh, programs to actually not just transfer knowledge about ways of flourishing organization, but actually to start thinking about road mapping and experimentation again. So it links obviously in a synergistic way with the logic of the of the lab. Okay, so there is both uh, learning, diffusion, experimentation uh, are uh, essential to the to the problem. Otherwise, those those challenges unfortunately might uh, stay with us for a very very long time. This is this is it. Uh, these are the key things, and then let me go on with the. Uh, with the icing at this point. I think the, uh, the first order of business is to clarify at least my own perspective on what we think uh, the uh, flourishing organization. I do have my own four Ps. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the first one is exactly what we heard before, obviously, it's about purpose. The way that I define the purpose of a flourishing organization is, I mean, we can discuss, you know, the definitions are uh, they are just for, for, for clarification. But the key idea is obviously the nurturing and realization of full potential of a whole host of actors, right? And it's not just the employees, obviously. We're talking about all the actors that fundamentally contribute to the establishment, the development, and the success of an organization, whether it's business or, or profit, non-profit, any organization, any political organization, or administrative organization. So, the uh, other component, of course, is the dimensions of performance. It's an integrated, multi dimensional uh, scale, right, across different aspects economics, social, ethical, environmental. We know this very well. The other component is, is a process uh, component. Each and every functional activity in the business organization uh, needs to fundamentally transform itself. Why? Because the purpose changes and the actors that are considered outside of the citadel of the organization have to be welcomed in, right? As we said before. That changes dramatically not only the governance mechanism, the boards and so on, it changes dramatically the way the strategic decisions are made We've got some wonderful examples, uh, just in, with, with Charles' uh, intervention, the way that the organization is, is structured, and obviously the, the way that uh, operating routines are, are handled. And finally, the, probably the biggest challenge, this is where the lean paradigm really comes to life, uh, is in the mindset. You know, how do we get managers and employees to transition to higher levels of consciousness? Uh, because that is, unless this happens, all the rest is superficial. Um, you know, this is the, the, the key engine that in fact allows really all the rest to go from just words and, and nice statements to uh, to reality. And uh, and obviously we need to we need to uh, collaboratively, uh, you know, figure out how to best make it happen at, at a global scale. That's the, that's the challenge before us. Actually, in the interest of time, let me just skip this. This is just to show you, by the way, it's not, it's my own rendition of uh, Stu Hart's, uh, Stuart Hart's, uh, um, relatively famous uh, way to think about value creation and sustainability. The biggest point, the, the, the only point that I would like to make, actually, on this slide, is that, you know, it's even not enough, so companies, start thinking about sustainability for risk protection, then they start, you know, thinking about it in terms of uh, efficiency, and all that is relatively straightforward with the existing resources. Then when they start thinking about new business model, that's where it really starts going from the now to the tomorrow, right? To the firm of the future, if you want. But even that is not enough, right? Because the new business model in and of itself can actually coexist with the old Paradigm. The new paradigm only happens when you know all the other elements, all the four P's, and particularly the mindsets, are actually transformed. So the the, uh, the identity, the, the the cognition, the emotional aspects of individuals 
are fundamentally reframed in the new uh, logic with the new purpose of the organization. Now, let me give you uh, my own uh, understanding of why we think that the business case is actually made. Um, and we shouldn't be too worried today about the, the why. Why is the transition important? Actually, it's been recently, over the last few years, uh, a, a, num a number of studies that actually have made, uh, even if they're restricted to just looking at the, uh, the economic uh, performance implication, have made a very clear case. This is a study published a couple of years ago uh, by some Harvard uh, colleagues. Uh, really doing a very, very good job with a matching, matched pair uh, sample of 90 companies that have a bit more sustainable practices than others. And they were very similar in 93, exactly the same model, number of dimensions, and then look at what happens over the uh, 17 years uh, following, both in terms of stock returns. So obviously this is the sample of uh, high sustainability. Now I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to call it already flourishing, but at least sustainability related uh, practices, and these are the low, and even more stunning actually in terms of returns on assets. Okay, so the fact that in the medium to long term sustainability pays off is now established. I think in terms of at least in terms of uh, uh, academic research. That's what I would uh, feel comfortable stating. Now, let's think about the real problem. So how do we actually get the whole world to understand what we would uh, 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 like to think is, is critical uh, as this transition to the new paradigm and how to actually do it? This is just some, some, some of my own thinking on the things that I've been doing that I think might be helpful for the discussion. So I'll go very rapidly through it, also because I don't have a lot of time left. So the first one is this uh, Global Organizational Learning Development Network. Is a, the network, by the way, not only of academics, but of a number of institutions that, that they are trying to actually work out uh, and experiment with these new processes, with new structures, governance structures, uh, processes, mindsets, and so on, using all sorts of uh, all the relevant, essentially, uh, sciences, particularly business science, but also social sciences and neuro neuroscience, environmental sciences, and uh, doing it with a uh, different type of designs, uh, fundamentally in a collaborative way. We call it engaged scholarship, right? Because this is not the academic going in, uh, getting data from the business, come back to your own thing, and then publish something that is never going to be uh, read. But the idea is actually you know, throughout the whole process to, to actually cooperate and generate uh, real outcomes and real change. That's the whole idea. I think it's at the same time insights, new knowledge, and field-based change that is uh, relevant and fundamentally, hopefully, uh, important for, for the organization to figure out, to experience what it is like to actually manage the business in a, in a, a new, new paradigm or in a, in a sustainable way. The, uh, this is the, the network. I'm just going to leave it there. By the way, the, the slides will be will be available. This is just to give you a list of the uh, some of the key uh, thinkers, but more importantly, the the subjects, the various sciences, uh, scientific domains that they are expert in. Uh, these are the, the various type of ex field experiments. So learning, this is not things that happen in the lab. These are things that we uh, want to design and. Uh, we designed it together collaboratively with companies and that go and touch all the key aspects of the, uh, of the uh, organizational uh, and business activities that are necessary in order to, to, uh, to start experiencing this new, you know, the, what is the flourishing organization. In particular, let me, let me zoom in on the uh, uh, learning and training uh, 
management development aspect because that is obviously very, very close to uh, uh, a lot of the discussion we had over the last couple of years and share with you a couple of, well, first of all, the, 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 the idea, the research program, right? First of all, we need to map the decisions uh, on the neuro, uh, you know, what happens in the brain vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, when, when managers make strategic development decisions that we have started or we're really at the beginning at that stage. Then we need to show the, the link between those neurocorrelate, those activations and performance, right? Performance, the quality of the decisions and the quality, so there's essentially the performance act, uh, outcomes across the various dimensions of performance. And finally, we need to show, uh, we need to identify and test the, the effectiveness of different possible uh, learning intervention, different possible, for example, type of uh, meditation processes that might work in certain contexts and not in others. We need to identify essentially and make uh, a scientific uh, case for the various uh, type of learning processes and the effectiveness of these learning processes. Just going to go very quickly on on these. Um, this is actually some some fine exploration exploitation is actually very uh, similar to is the, is the logic actually of the two challenges that actually Charles was talking about that the CEOs are 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 uh, uh, struggling with. Turns out that that we are not wired in our brain to actually do the two things at the same time: explore new ideas and explore new ideas. Are two different neural uh, systems, uh, and the key is actually to, to switch over uh, the, uh, appropriately over the two systems. We've, we've seen it, we've tested it with uh, a sample of managers and entrepreneurs, and we've seen that, especially in exploration, entrepreneurs actually activate much better and the, the whole prefrontal cortex, both on the left and the right side, and particularly important, they have this one little uh, blue ball in the ancient part of the brain called the locus ceruleus, which is if you want to switch from an explorative and, 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 uh, and an exploitative way to use our attention, they're much more, uh, much stronger in, the, in their capacity to activate that, that switch. Okay, that's that's, uh, that's a one interesting piece of evidence. Um, the other interesting piece of evidence is the actual the impact of, of meditation on the development actually of sustainability related decisions. And this is uh, uh, one, one uh, experiment that we recently made. We have a working paper, so those of you who are interested, be delighted to share with you. Uh, so these are students, these are now managers, uh, graduate students uh, specialized in, in uh, innovation management at, at Balconi. Uh, we did a yoga uh, intervention, four weeks, 16 hours of really deep meditation uh, training. So, geared towards the awakening of the subtle uh, energies and the learning how to use those uh, subtle energies. So, you know, the whole, the whole uh, subtle system with all the chakras. And uh, the impact is not only in terms of uh, both emotional and physical well-being, what we found is a significant impact in their uh, value system, so with a uh, significant increase of their cooperativeness, of the importance of cooperativeness and self self-transcendent uh, values in the intervention versus the, uh, the control sample. Even more importantly, the, uh, behavior, the uh, behavioral outcomes, the decisions, the sustainability decisions that we use as sustainability business simulation, computer-based simulation, to, to look at what happens. Uh, and we found that they were much more willing uh, and capable of uh, resisting the temptation essentially to get immediate short-term rewards and they were able obviously to, to uh, generate you know, stronger uh, rewards not only for their own company but for the whole sector. This is in the fishing, in the fishing industry. Most interesting at all, of all is we found actually the growth in just, it was just a four week intervention, growth in the uh, density of the gray matter 
in an area uh, right in here uh, from the gyrus, the area that is responsible for the capacity to resist the temptation to access immediate rewards, right? Which is a fundamental uh, problem in, in sustainability and and, uh, and flourishing issues. So, both by the way, we found in addition to this also uh, results in the uh, activation of ACC, a much stronger activation. But you know, the fact that we actually have uh, in addition to the activation also results on the uh, uh, on the magnitude and the density of the other green matters is really important. That's all I wanted to say. I'm going to keep uh, this one for you to kind of maybe have a final second of uh, appreciation uh, of at least my own uh, my own way to think about the challenges and some of the possible solutions. Hopefully, we'll be able to discuss them. Thank you so much for your attention.